Thanks so much for coming. Um, as Sarah said, my name is Tyler Ann Binder, and we're going to talk for the next 30 to 45 minutes about five points, and then we'll open things up for questions, and hopefully you guys will have lots of questions. Um, the first question we had already, where is five points? We're going to get to that in, in, well, we'll get to it right now. So here's Manhattan, there's Central Park, here's Houston Street, here's Canal Street, below Canal Street, between really center and the Bowery, okay, below Canal, between center and the Bowery, that's five points. It's basically now the bottom of old Chinatown, kind of where Chinatown meets the courthouses, that's where five points was. So five points uh, was infamous in its era, and the students who've been reading about it know this. Five points was infamous in its day, and its day was pretty much the entire 19th century, as one of the most infamous neighborhoods in all the United States, really in all the world. So let's start with talking about why it was so infamous. This painting from 1829 pretty much encapsulates Five Points' reputation. So what you see here is a couple of things. So here's a woman with her breasts almost hanging out of her dress, hanging out the window there. Prostitution, one thing Five Points was famous for. You'll see here there is a big fight going on, kind of a street fight, though it's hard to tell how many of the people are fighting and how many are gathered around the fighters and betting on who will win. So fighting, riots, that was another thing Five Points was famous for. You'll see here in the painting there are pigs out here in the street eating the garbage. So Five Points was famous also for its filth. Another thing you'll notice in the painting is there are blacks and whites together intermingling. In 1829, this would have been seen by a higher society as an outrageous thing to have the races intermingling so freely and openly. Now, another thing that you wouldn't notice, and we'll talk about this more in a minute, um, here, but notice how many groceries there are. So, right, grocery, it says there. Grocery, it says there. Grocery, it says there. Grocery there. Grocery here. Grocery there. So today we think grocery was the big deal, but in those days, groceries also served as liquor stores. So by painting, by showing all these groceries, what you're right away seeing is this is a place where alcohol runs freely, and that was another thing Five Points was famous for: uh, the drunkenness and just the saloons everywhere. And then a thing that's hard to see, um, these are wooden tenements. And the other thing Five Points was famous for was the dilapidated, unhealthy conditions of its tenements, which were considered the worst in the city. So what we're going to do over the next half hour is talk about each of these things, and then how these conditions were exacerbated in the late 1840s and early 1850s by the potato famine in Ireland, and the resulting uh, huge influx of refugees from Ireland to New York. The poorest of them settled in Five Points, making the conditions that were considered bad already now even worse, making the neighborhood's fame now even more infamous. And then we'll talk about what happens to the neighborhood over the rest of the 19th century, how it eventually becomes Little Italy, um, Chinatown, and then kind of what the neighborhood is like today. Those last parts will be relatively brief. We're going to focus on kind of the period of its, the peak of fame, and that's during the period when it was an Irish neighborhood. So we're going to go through each of these aspects that I just talked about now. So one was the dilapidated wooden tenements. It's hard to see that in the painting. This gives you a little better sense of it. Um, you have these two and a half story wooden buildings. They weren't built originally as tenements. They were built as, in essence, single-family houses, but kind of single-family plus. The, the intention of those buildings was that you would have, say, a shoemaker who would buy the house. And the shoemaker would have his store in the front of the ground floor of the house. And then in the back, his family would live. And then maybe on the second floor, his employees would live 
in those days it was very common, the early 1800s and before, to have your employees live with the employer. And then in the top, in this little kind of garret part, kind of a half story, you might have the workshop where the shoes were made. Or you might reverse it and have the shoes made on the second floor and the workers sleep in the garret. But in any case, all that stuff went on in the house. But as lots of immigrants began pouring into the city in the early 1800s, uh, the owners of these houses realized they could make a lot more money um, by subdividing the house into apartments and renting the apartments to the incoming immigrants. And so the shoemakers and the other business owners moved out of the neighborhood. They subdivide these houses. They'll put maybe three or four apartments on the ground floor, same up here, maybe two up here. And now you're, you have 10 apartments where before you had one family, a couple of employees, and a workshop. And so as a result, these tenements became very crowded, because that's they're now holding a lot more people than they were designed to hold. Um, they become dirty in part because the landlords, uh, and you guys, you know, when I give talks like in Virginia where I live, people don't understand this, but you guys will understand this. When the landlord doesn't live in the building, the building sometimes, uh, the conditions aren't so good. And, and that happens. Also, the sanitary facilities just aren't sufficient to deal with the number of people. So the number of outhouses in the backyard, there might be two. And that was fine when you had one family and a couple of workers. But it's not fine now that you have, you know, a couple of dozen people living in the house. And so those two outhouses are going to be overused, they're going to become filthy, and so forth. The other thing that people complained about with these outhouses, uh, or with the tenement, with wooden tenements, was how cold they got. So they were not well heated. They were designed to be heated, you know, to have one room where the family would gather in the winter to stay warm. So they're not really designed to have 10 different places where they're going to get heated for the 10 families you might have in them. Uh, the windows tended to be broken, uh, with panes of glass missing the windows not being hung right uh, or falling off their hinges. And as a result, um, they're known as very cold. And what you'll often see is people would put up posters on their walls. And this wasn't for decoration. It was to keep the wind from whistling through the walls. And this gives you a sense when I talked about the backyards of these wooden tenements. Here is the backyard of a wooden tenement. Here are some outhouses. Here is the pump where you got your water from. Suffice it to say, it's not a good idea to have the filth from the outhouses going down into the ground and the water coming up from the ground right next to the outhouses. And then as you get more and more people into these buildings, that becomes a worse and worse situation. So Five Points has its name because it's the intersection it's the intersection of three streets. So you have, you have what's now Baxter Street, which runs this way. You have Cross Street, which doesn't exist anymore. But over here is called Moscow Street now. It's still, this part exists. And then you have Worth Street, which came to here but then stopped. And so you had this weird five-cornered intersection. And that was why it was known as Five Points. One of those, as I said, was Worth Street. So this is Worth Street, which still exists, looking west towards Center Street. Worth Street was famous, among other things, in this period we're talking about, for prostitution. So one of the most famous brothels in the neighborhood was right here. Here's some of the sheets being hung out the window. Uh, right here at the corner of Baxter and Worth Street. Um, it was said that there was that every building along this block of Worth Street had a brothel in it. And the same thing as so this street here and this street here. Every building had a brothel in it. And at first, I thought that was really hard to, uh, to believe. But I went in my research, I went down to the municipal archives on Chamber Street, and I got out the police arrest records. And I started counting up and writing down the addresses where various brothels had been closed down by the police. And once I added up all the addresses, it, it actually was true. Every building had a brothel. Now, that doesn't mean every building had a brothel simultaneously. But 
what we're talking about when we're talking about brothels was somebody would take one of the apartments in these tenements and that would become the brothel. So it wasn't so hard to make a brothel. You didn't need a, a freestanding building. Again, this is a tenement, there's an apartment, and there's your brothel. So another thing that Five Points was infamous for in the period we're talking about here was its dance halls. Uh, these were kind of rowdy, bawdy dance halls. Now, you might think today, you think dance hall, you think about a club you might go to, huge dance floor, huge space. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about your dance floor would typically be maybe 12 feet square, maybe 10 feet square. And you would have a 12 by 12 foot room, and in that room you had the bar, the band, and the dancers, all in that 12 by 12 foot room. So when we talk about dance hall, hall is, is kind of euphemistic. These are tiny, cramped places. But still, the dancers would squeeze in. The dance floor would be really crowded. People would sweat. Um, one of the, again, the infamous things about the Five Points dance halls was you had white and black dancing together, which, again, for New York in the 1830s was considered uh, by many to be an outrageous thing, but, but was very common and accepted among the population of Five Points. In fact, as the, the subtitle of my Five Points book points out, uh, historians of American dance believe that, that tap dancing was invented in Five Points, in these dance halls. We would have Irish immigrants come in and do their kind of step dancing uh, kind of thing. You know, if you know Irish dance, like river dance, you kind of have that, that sense of what that looks like. And then you had uh, African Americans bringing their dance styles their most famous one at that point was called the shuffle. And you combine kind of the high-stepping Irish dance with the African-American shuffle, and supposedly that's where tap dance gets invented. And so this is an image of the most famous Five Points dancer. He, his stage name was Master Juba. Uh, and he uh, became so famous, not just in New York, that he toured the United States and actually toured Europe as well. Uh, playing to packed crowds, including he danced for Queen Victoria in England, so he was, he was world famous. And he starts out in five points. Some of Five Points tenements became so notorious that their names were known throughout the city. The most famous of these was known as the Old Brewery, which is pictured here. So the old brewery, as the name implies, started out as a brewery because Five Points was built over a lake. There used to be a lake by Center Street. The reason it was called Center Street when they laid it out was because they laid Center Street out through the center of what had been the lake. And one of the reasons Five Points was a place that most people didn't want to live was because uh, since they put the neighborhood over the lake and the lake was supplied by be from below, the houses, as soon as they were built, started to kind of shift and tilt, and the basements were always very damp. And in those days, not knowing where diseases came from, um, people associated diseases with dampness. And there was some truth to this, because a lot of the diseases that they would get in that period were waterborne. So people didn't want to live in houses that had perpetually wet basements. And that's what Five Points houses had. So the brewery was built at the edge of the lake. Then once they filled in the lake, it couldn't be a brewery anymore, so it was turned into a tenement. And it was a particularly huge, cavernous tenement with lots of apartments that had no windows to the outside at all because obviously it had not been built for the purpose of being a tenement. And so the, the old brewery was, was infamous as a haunt of criminals who would hide in the, in the old brewery when they were escaping from the police because it was said the police were so... Uh, were too afraid to go in there. But the old brewery is a good example of how you have to be careful as a historian when you, uh, when you read what people wrote about Five Points. So it was com it's commonly said in some of the older history books that the old brewery was, was so dangerous that in its heyday a murder a day was committed there. But we know that can't be right because this is a period when all of New York City, which then admittedly was just Manhattan, but still, all of New York City with a million people, uh, there weren't more than a dozen murders a year. Right? In those days where very few people have guns, it's pretty hard to kill somebody. 
So we know there wasn't a murder a day. Just the bodies would have piled up too high. Nonetheless, that was the, the kind of reputation it had. And there were several dozen other tenements in five points that were so notorious that they too were known by a name. So this is the situation in five points even before this famine grips Ireland. So in 1845, uh, a weird blight starts to hit the potato plants of Ireland and Scotland and Germany for that matter. Uh, the, the blight was caused by a fungus from the seed potatoes. What, the way you grow potatoes is you take a little tiny potato, you put it in the ground, and up grows a potato plant, and lots of big potatoes will grow under the ground with that little seed potato. The Irish got their seed potatoes from the United States. American farmers um, fertilized their potatoes with Peruvian bird droppings called guano. Those Peruvian bird droppings happen to get a fungus. Now, that fungus would die during the hot American summers. It would be baked to death. But Ireland is cold and damp and cloudy all the time. Not cold, but cool. And that's a perfect environment for the fungus to flourish. So the fungus infects the potato plants. And just before harvest in 1845, the plants turn gray and crumble into dust. And the Irish very worried about this because in the poor parts of Ireland, people ate potatoes for every meal. And when I say they ate potatoes for every meal, I don't mean they had it as a side dish at every meal. I mean it was the entire meal. Potatoes for breakfast, potatoes for lunch, and potatoes for dinner. That was all you had. No other food if you were one of the, you know, maybe poorest 30 or 40 percent of the Irish population. Now we are talking about a lot of potatoes, at least before the blight. The average man, you know, kind of guys your age, uh, in the back I'm talking about the younger, uh, hungrier guys, would eat on average 14 pounds of potatoes per day. Okay? And the female students, you know, the women of about age 20, they'd eat about 8 or 9 pounds of potatoes per day. And you have potatoes for lunch, potatoes for breakfast, potatoes for dinner, always boiled. Right? Never baked, never fried. No, no way except boiled. And the only, th <coughs> the only thing you had to put on them was salt. Right? So as you can imagine, this diet's very, very, very monotonous. Yet you're thankful for the potato because it's a very nutritious thing and it, you actually can survive just on potatoes. It's got vitamin C, it's got most everything you need. Uh, so when the potato blight hits and 60% of the potato crop is destroyed, the Irish uh, suffer a great deal. But they manage to survive until 1846 when the next crop is anxiously awaited, but not knowing what the problem was, they planted more fungus-filled seed potatoes. And in 1840, in the harvest of 1846, it was even worse, 90% of the crop was lost. And so now people start, star uh, start starving. The Irish population before the famine had been 8 million people. Of those 8 million people, about a million die. So one out of every eight inhabitants of Ireland die. Another one and a half million flee Ireland. And while some go to England and some go to Canada, most of those million and a half, probably about a million of them, go to the United States. And so this is what today we'd call a refugee crisis, right? We have a million people entering the United States suddenly, and that's, they're entering a country whose population is 25 million. That's a huge impact on the United States. And they don't spread out evenly across the country. There was no government program like we have today where we place refugees, you know, in Minnesota and in Iowa and in Utah. The refugees were paying their own way to America. And when they get here, most of them are too poor to go any further than where the ship leaves them off. So the bulk of the immigrants go to New York, which has the biggest port the most ships coming of any other place. The second most go to Boston, and then a lot go to Baltimore and Philadelphia and those kinds of places. And eventually they'll start to spread out across the country, but even so, we, when we say spread out, they might go to Westchester or here to Brooklyn or to Jersey City. And that's the extent, you know, 98%, that's as far as they would get. And as you can see, this is the kind of 
living situation these immigrants would have had before. They would have had a hut made of stone walls, maybe mud covering the stones, see a dirt, a dirt floor covered if they had it with some straw or hay, a thatched roof. This roof is actually a nicer thatched roof than they would have had. This is actually made from, from, uh, from straw or hay. What they would have used to make their roofs were the dead uh, stems of potato plants because if they had hay, that would have been very valuable to feed the cows and too valuable to put on, on top of a house. So the Irish are leaving this kind of situation and arriving in a place like Five Points, which as you can imagine is a big shock to them. Oh yeah, this by the way, that's potato plant. This is what the leaves look like after the blight hit. This is some images of the famine victims. Here are people on the left uh, going through the fields looking for any potatoes that might have been missed that they might be able to eat. And there's an image of some, some famine victims, just totally emaciated. So, these people get on ships. Now, like today, you would think, well, they could just go from Ireland to America. But no, just like today, how do you get the cheapest fare? You got to stop somewhere. So the Irish, not having much money, went for the cheapest fare. So they actually traveled in the wrong direction to Liverpool in order to go to that hub where you could get the cheapest fares to head on to the United States. And so this is uh, an image of a ship leaving Liverpool full of people and heading to the United States. The conditions on those ships, as you can imagine with a lot of people who are half starved by this point, were not very good. Now here's something that's actually similar to today. Now, you know, if I'd given this talk when my Five Points book came out 17 years ago. People would not understand this, but you guys do if you've been on an airplane lately and you see, did they serve you any food? No. All right? So, the same thing in this period. Now, you're getting on this ship, the, the length of the trip on average is five weeks. Five weeks from Liverpool to New York. Because um, it's a sailing ship, the ship's going against the prevailing winds, and so what you end up with is a sailing ship that's going three miles per hour. Three miles per hour across the Atlantic Ocean. Now, it had been back when those earlier immigrants had come to Five Points, these ships were required to give no food at all to people. None. Um, but because people had started starving on these ships when the ships would, would uh, uh, because poor immigrants wouldn't bring food, the idea was you're supposed to bring your own food. Supposed to bring five weeks worth of food on the ship and five weeks worth of water. Right, so imagine you're getting on the ship, five weeks worth of food, five weeks worth of water. But these famine immigrants, they don't have that. They're fleeing. They're taking what little they have. They're just hoping they somehow survive the voyage. And so by this point, the British, to prevent the people from starving on the ship, required that each day you're given the following you're given one cup of meal. And that would typically mean. Not oatmeal, which would be fairly filling, but one cup of, typically it meant cornmeal, but sometimes it was just flour. And 12 ounces of water for every 24 hours you're on the boat. So imagine that, 12 ounces of water for every 24 hours you're on the boat. Does that sound like enough water? No, it does not sound. Plus, what are you doing with the water? You're mixing it with your meal to make yourself a pancake. That's your one meal on the ship you have each day if you're so poor that you couldn't afford to bring any food. So you've got, you've got to pour half the water into the pancake, into the flour just to make your pancake. Now you've got six ounces of water left for the whole day. Now the other thing the ship is, is required to give you is once a week, they're required to give you salt pork. Basically what today we'd call beef jerky, but it was made of pork. Super, super, super salty. So you eat that, now you only get it once a week and you probably eat it pretty quickly. You get a couple of ounces once a week. And that makes you super thirsty. And you have your six ounces of water left after you've made your pancake. And yet you're surrounded by water, right? You're on and this little ship on the sea, surrounded by water you can't drink. And you're thirsty, thirsty, thirsty for the entire five weeks of your journey. You're thirsty even if this happens, right? Always there's a storm at some point on your voyage. And scenes like this below decks as the water pours in. And yet you're thirsty. And you try drinking this water, and it tastes disgusting, and you spit it out. 
and so you're thirsty. And so when you get to New York, you're grateful to be there. And you obviously drink as much water as you can as soon as you get off the boat. So this is an image of five points. It's actually the same, one of the same blocks we we're looking at in that painting. But now, and these are the wooden tenements that have become pretty dilapidated by the time this picture was taken, which is 1869. And now they've started to build some brick tenements. And those brick tenements are built starting in the late 1840s when all those famine immigrants flood in. And the owners of the little wooden tenements, they realize, you know, I can maybe rent this house to 10 different families and I can make a good amount of money. But if I replace my brick house, my wooden house with a five-story brick tenement, I can rent it to 24 different families because there's four apartments per floor there. And now I can make more than double the money. So if I can afford to build the building, I'm going to pretty quickly recoup my expenses and then I'm going to be making much more profit. And so these buildings get built. And so by the time the, the potato famine is over in the mid-1850s, 60% uh, of the tenements in Five Points are, are brick tenements. Some landlords who are especially greedy, have you ever heard of that, a greedy New York landlord? Impossible. <laughs> what they do is they build, so this would be kind of that five-story brick tenement we just saw. And then, and that typically covers 50 feet. It's 25 feet in the front and 50 feet deep. And the typical Manhattan lot is 25 by 100, so that left a 50-foot backyard. So some of these really greedy ten uh, tenement owners, they decide, well, why not build a tenement in the backyard too? And then we can quadruple the amount of rent we were bringing in when we had our one wooden tenement. And that's what they do. And you can still go down to Chinatown if you go to Mulberry Street, Mott Street. Uh, today, those buildings that were built in the 18 20s, 30s, 40s are still standing. And if you're lucky, it's, it's harder, you know, back uh, when I was writing Five Points in the 90s, nobody locked these buildings. You could just walk right in and go into the back and you could see the rear tenements just virtually right on top of the front tenement because they're still there and they're still full of immigrants. Now, Chinese immigrants um, or sometimes gentrifying uh, people. But in any case, they're still there. You just can't really see them from the front. Because typically, if you build five stories in the front, you build four stories in the back. If you build six stories in the front, you build five in the back. So you can't see these things from the front, but they're there. And so here's what one of these lots would look like. Here's your front building, the brick building that I described, and there's the rear building. So this is 25 feet wide, 50 feet deep. Then that rear tenement is 25 feet wide and 25 feet deep. So each floor, you have four apartments on this building and two apartments for, per floor on that building. And then you have this 25 by 25 foot yard that has the pump and now a lot of privies, which is what they call their outhouses back then. And so notice the size of these apartments. So each apartment has two rooms. This front room, is both your living room, your kitchen, and at night as we'll see your bedroom. And then in the, and this room is 12 by 12. And then the back room here in the typical layout is, ranges from six by eight feet to eight by 10 feet, depending on the exact footprint of the lot. So your whole apartment is 225 square feet. And let's take a look inside one of those apartments. So here's a photo from 1890 of one of those apartments built in the 1840s. So here we are in that front room. You notice here's the stove. And here's the family of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven in those two rooms. And so notice what they've done is they've got a bed here. They've got the crib here for the little one, though it looks like she's outgrowing the crib. Um, and then in the back room, you can barely see the posts of what looks like a brass bed or a fake brass bed back here. And so typically what would happen is the parents would sleep back here. And that room was known as the sleeping closet because it's like a walk-in closet today. Now keep in mind when the Irish were there, this window would not have been here. This would have been a wall. And I'll explain in a second why that's there. So the parents back there and then the five kids would sleep in this 12 by 12 room. This bed would hold two or maybe three head to foot. So if you're 
sibling has stinky feet, you're going to know it. And then you got one here. And then you typically would have a mattress sometimes just filled with straw. Um, and you'd pull that out into the middle of the room, put that down there, and that's where some of the kids would sleep at night. And so in an effort to try to prevent landlords from building tenements like this, in 1867, New York State passed a law saying that every inhabited room in a tenement had to have a window. So they thought what that would, the state legislature thought what that would mean was then they'd have to have windows to the outside. But what the greedy landlords did was they said, oh, we'll put a window right here. Now this room has a window. And it's only in, uh, and, and the landlords then, like today, had a lot of political power. So even though reformers complained about this, the landlords used their political clout in Albany to ensure that the law had these loopholes. And it's only in 1901 that the state legislature finally passes a law that mandates that every inhabited room have a window to the, directly to the outside. So, so one of the things that would happen with these apartments, oh, let me start it with here though. So here you've got seven people in these two rooms. But what often happened was, say you only had a family of four, you might say, oh, lots of room to uh, spread out. But no, what a typical family of four would do if they're Irish immigrants is they'd, they'd rent space in the apartment to some boarders. So if you only had four in the family, you might rent the sleeping closet to boarders. And then you'd sleep all, the family would sleep out here. Or sometimes you'd do the opposite, you'd sleep here and you'd have the boarders sleep here. Now, of course, immigrants are nothing if not enterprising. And so what the Irish often would do would be they would rent a tenement apartment, but then lay it out so the entire thing, they would rent the entire thing to boarders. So you might have an apartment at one end of the hallway, and when the apartment across the hall became free, you'd rent that. You'd put some beds in it, like these Irish immigrants have done, and you'd turn it into a boarding house. And you'd make a profit that way. And that's what these people have done. This is a, an image from 1859. This is actually an image, right, remember that photo I showed you of the big brick building and the small wooden buildings? This is inside one of those uh, small wooden buildings. And you paid six cents a night for a space in this room. That doesn't mean six cents for a bed, right? If the, the place was fairly empty that night, you got a whole bed yourself. But if it was crowded, you shared the bed, maybe with one person, maybe with two people which you had experience with because on, on board the ship, I forgot to mention this, on board the ship, the beds, at first you say, oh, this is good. The beds were the size of modern king-size beds, at least in terms of width. They'd be six feet long and six feet wide. But the rule was three adults per one of those beds. And if you had children, it would be uh, two adults and two children. So you had to have at least three adults or children in, in the bed besides. Now you think about it, three adults. So there's always going to be one stranger in there with you. All right? and, uh, and so that was one of the things that people hated about those ships. That was the thing that women most hated about those ships. Uh, because there was no guarantee, you know, you could be uh, surrounded by strange men on the ship in the period before the Civil War. By the time you get to the Civil War, the, Eng the British pass laws and they say that women have to be housed separately on these ships from men. And at first what they do is they just say, all right, single women have to be housed separately. And the married women will go in these beds with their husband, but then they stick another guy in the bed and those guys' hands wander. And so then in 1867, they have to pass another law and say all women have to be kept separately from all adult men. So the women and children are in one part of the ship and men, whether they're married or single, are put in a different part of the ship. The worst kind of boarding houses were in windowless basements. So that brick building I showed you the photo of, it had a basement. It was not meant to be inhabited. But again, either greedy landlords or, and often what it would be, would be an Irish immigrant would go to the landlord and say, hey, there's nothing in the basement. How about you rent it out to me? And then that immigrant would turn it into another boarding house. This image is one of my favorites. So the wooden tenements 
were infamous for how cold they got in the winter. The brick tenements, people didn't have that complaint. They had the opposite complaint, how hot they got in the summer. Because these brick tenements, the, the whole building was supported by the brick walls. That's why there were only five or six or at most seven stories, because that was as high as they could build them without fear of them tumbling over. And so those walls were a foot thick of brick. And towards the bottom, sometimes even thicker than a foot. And so if there's a side of the building that faces the sun, the building would turn into a brick oven. And long after the sun went down, those bricks would continue to give off heat. And so in the summer, especially during quote unquote heat wave, which of course a heat wave in the 1850s was not as hot as our heat we get today, people would sleep outside in the summer. So you can hear, see here sleep, people sleeping on the doorsteps, up on the top of this awning here. There are no fire escapes yet at this point. That's post-Civil War. Once we get to the post-Civil War period, people will sleep on the fire escapes. And then you can see it over there on the upper right, people sleep on the roof as well. Anything to escape the heat. So one of the big problems with these conditions, the heat, the sanitary conditions because of where the water came from, how close it was to the outhouses, was that the people who lived in these buildings died at about double the rate of people who lived uptown in the nicer neighborhoods. This is an image of a funeral, a hearse coming out of the building. This is that tall brick building I showed you in the photo next to those small wooden buildings. Right? So that big brick building has more than its fair share of death. It was a totally Irish immigrant building. And a lot of deaths in that building. Even though you would think that brick building would be much nicer than those wooden buildings next to it. Can anybody guess why? You notice here in uh, this photo that the wooden building is now below street level. Anybody guess why that would be? Sunk. That was a great guess. It turns out it's not right. The reason is, so they start building sewer, they start laying sewer lines in New York in the 1850s. And the way it worked in those days, maybe it's still the case today. I haven't lived in New York since 1990, so you guys can tell me. But the way it worked back then was the nice neighborhoods got the sewers first, and the poorer neighborhoods got them last. So Five Points got its sewers last, not until uh, the mid-1860s. They didn't want to spend the money to dig up the streets and put the sewers below the street. So what they did was they laid the sewer pipes on top of the street, and then they covered over the sewer lines with dirt and raised the level of the street above the sewer pipes. And so that's why the entire level of the street on this block was raised. And so there used to be steps leading up to the door to this building. Now the steps are gone. This, now you have to go downstairs to get into the main level of this building. And you can see, by the way, these are, these are kids. They have a dog. They've tied a, a rope to the dog's leg and they're torturing the dog. As I said before, one of the things that made Five Points so infamous was its groceries. And that's because of the alcohol that was sold in them. And so, because these tenement apartments were so small, people didn't want to stay cooped up in their tenements all day. So, the housewives would come out and they'd go to the groceries, and the grocers, realizing there was a demand for people who wanted to stay and drink in the groceries, put little tiny bars in the groceries. And now the Irish immigrant women would drink there. And that was one of the things that made Five Points so infamous. It was one thing for men to drink. People thought, well, men are going to drink. But for women to drink in public, native-born Americans considered that uh, extremely uncouth. Another thing Five Points is famous for is its riots. Uh, 1830s, 1840s, 1850s, there are riots in, in Five Points over and over again. Early in its history, the riots tend to be between its immigrant inhabitants and native-born people from other parts of the city who come to attack the immigrants. This is an, a riot from the 1850s, uh, from 1857, and this is a riot that takes place between two rival groups of Irish immigrants, two gangs of Irish immigrants, really. And you can actually go, this is, this is the corner of, of Bayard and Elizabeth Street. So you can go there, it's just one block off of the Bowery, you can go there today and imagine yourself. And most of these tenements are actually 
still there. You can actually see the exact same minus this little wooden awning thing. And, and they're still there. And this was a riot between two rival gangs of Irish immigrants fighting for control of the neighborhood. You especially had riots in Five Points on election days. And that would be for a couple of reasons. So this is voting um, on election day in Five Points in 1858. The polling place is in the back room of a saloon. And that was done on purpose. In those days, politicians would put the voting place in the place they thought that their supporters would most likely turn out to and their opponents would least likely turn out to. So in five points, you put the voting place in the back room of a scary looking saloon, scary looking to a lot of outsiders at least. So that therefore, all your, in this case, Democratic friends will go vote and all the Republicans will stay home and not vote and the, the hope was you know, there's no chance of a Republican winning an election for a five points office like Alderman. But the hope is if you keep enough Republicans away, maybe that will prevent the Republicans from winning the citywide races like for mayor. And so you can see in this image, this is one of Thomas Nast's most famous cartoons. It is an image in which Nast is trying to show why people should not vote for the, Repub for the Democratic candidate for president in 1868. That was Horatio Seymour, who had been governor of New York. And instead, they should vote for Ulysses S. Grant. And what NASA is saying is these are the three main supporters of the Democratic Party. This is um, this guy with his CSA, Confederate States of America, is Nathan Bedford Forrest, famous Confederate colonel guy who claimed proudly to have started the Ku Klux Klan. So NASA is saying, if you vote Democrat, you're voting for Klansmen. Then here, this is a picture of a famous New Yorker whose name was August Belmont. You don't know much about him anymore except maybe a Belmont racetrack named after him, those who know that. And it says right on his little lapel there, Fifth Avenue. And he's got this big wad of capital money. So that's showing kind of the rich Fifth Avenue capitalists support the Democrats, the Klansmen, and then what's the third pillar of support for the Democrats? This guy whose hat says five points, and he's made to look like an ape, and that was the way that the Irish were caricatured. They were subhuman, more ape-like than human. And so the three of them have their boots on the poor freedman who fought. He's got his uniform, and he fought for the Union Army, and yet if the Democrats win, this is what will happen to the freedmen, is what NAST is saying. So Five Points became so famous that people would go to visit it. It was a tourist attraction. It was a tourist attraction ever since the 1820s. We know all these people, starting with people like Davy Crockett, who came to New York and he writes in his memoir, when I went to New York, one of the things I wanted to see was Five Points, and it was as bad as people say. And I thought I'm pretty brave. I've stood up to a bear in the forest and a mountain lion. But boy, was I scared when I went to Five Points. <laughs> so what people would typically do when they went visiting is they would pay a policeman to take them on a guided tour. And this became known as slumming. And the term slumming is invented for these tours of Five Points. Now, one of the most interesting things, and if, you, if you've read the Five Points book and you get far enough along in the book, what you'll find is one of the nice things I found in working on the book was the records of the Emigrant Savings Bank. And now they're really easy to get a hold of because they're on Ancestry.com. Um, but I had to go use them at New York Public Library. And I found that the, the bank was near Five Points, and a lot of Five Pointers had bank accounts there. And so the amazing thing I found was, despite the neighborhood's reputation, the inhabitants of the neighborhood actually had a good amount of money, like a lot more than you would expect, given the neighborhood's reputation, given how terrible the tenements were. And, and so what I came to realize was, and this is the case with immigrants today, just like it was back then, is you know, immigrants are not conspicuous consumers. Immigrants save their money. Immigrants are used to self-deprivation. Right? So if you're a famine immigrant, you've got parents probably back in Ireland. And so you're saving as much money as you can so you can send it to them and help support them, help them pay their rent, make sure they have food. 
or you're trying to save enough money so you can stop working as a day laborer or a domestic servant and either get a better job or stop working, start a business. So the five pointers, a lot of them could afford a better neighborhood but chose to stay there because it was cheap, because they were surrounded by Irish immigrants, um, and because to them the most important thing was saving and not how they looked to other people. And besides, if you had lived in that, that hut with the dirt floor and the potato scraws for a roof and no ceiling at all, then these tenements didn't seem so bad. So, we'll just end by talking about what happens to five points. So five points, um, this is a photograph from 1901 of Mulberry Street. And again, pretty much all these buildings are still there. This is the block of Mulberry Street looking north from Bayard towards Canal. Canal, the corner of Canal is right here. And now it's an Italian neighborhood. What happens is, by the 1870s, the Irish aren't immigrating so much, and the Irish who live in Five Points are finally moving to better neighborhoods, in part because Italians are starting to arrive in New York in large numbers, and they go to the poorest, cheapest place to live, uh, Five Points. And so quickly the, I the Italians displace the Irish and it becomes an Italian neighborhood. And so here you've got your Italians selling all their fruits and vegetables uh, on the street, living in the same tenements that the Irish had lived in. Jacob Reese, you guys probably know because what, there's a beach named after him, a park. Um, so Jacob Rees was an immigrant himself from Denmark who arrived in New York around 1870. Um, and he becomes a reporter and he covers crime. His, his police uh, headquarters is his, is his beat. And one of the things he, he sees is the police going and by this point there are laws mandating that you can't have more than a certain number of people per square foot of an apartment. And so he'll go with the police on these raids. This is a photograph that Reese takes of one of those raids. And here you've got, again, this is one of those 12 by 12 foot rooms. And you've got one, two, three, four, five, six people who you can see. But Reese said there were seven more people. Here's the foot of the seventh person on the floor. So there, there were 13 people in this 12 by 12 foot room. And so Reese makes in his journalism, doing something about these conditions, kind of his his quest, his, what's the right word for that? His, uh, mission. his mission, yes. And he takes more photos to try to convince people in better neighborhoods of New York the problems that the neighborhood face. So this photo is perhaps his most famous. It's called Bandit's Roost. It's of an alleyway behind one of the tenements on Mulberry Street. This is kind of to the 1890s what that painting of Five Points from the 1820s was. It's got every element of, of uh, trying to show how terrible this neighborhood is. And clearly, Reese must have found these people and at least some of them and gotten them to pose for the picture. Because this is still the day where you have to tell people you have to stand still for 30 seconds to take their picture. So here, I know it's hard to tell today, so this guy with the black jacket, the black vest, and the bowler hat, that's your gang uniform. Everybody in the 1890s would know, you're wearing that, he's a gang member. Then here's a guy, believe it or not, with a twin barrel shotgun. Now that is not your typical five points weapon of choice. So it's not clear whether Reese brought his own shotgun and found somebody to pose with it, or the guy happened to own one and says, oh, bring it down from your apartment. But in any case, this guy's got a shotgun. Reese talks about women like this. He calls this woman an old hag. His term, not mine. So the old hags of Five Points, according to Reese, were famous for running stale beer dives. So these would be saloons that were for the lowest of the low, the most drunk of the drunks, the most alcoholic. This is a place where they would go to regular saloons and they would buy the empty beer barrels from the saloon keepers. And the beer barrel would have a little bit of beer at the bottom. But you couldn't get it out of the, the tap without it just being all foam. And so that would sit at the bottom, it would go flat. She would buy that beer barrel from the saloon keeper, take the flat beer out, pour some chemicals in it to give it a foam head again, and then sell it. The chemicals were really bad for people. 
but they would sell that beer for a third of the price that a saloon would sell good beer for. And so the worst drunks and alcoholics would go into these back alley stale beer dives to get their fix of alcohol. And so these are just some of the, the aspects. And then you've got that laundry there perfectly filtering the light. And this just perfectly encap encapsulates why Reese says something has to be done. And what Reese says is there's no way to fix the tenements. He says immigrants are always going to crowd because they're trying to save money. And the poorest places in the city are always going to attract alcoholics, homeless, and so forth. So what Reese says is the only thing you can do to fix five points is to tear it down. And so he succeeds in getting the worst block. So this is one square block. The five points intersection was right here. Bandit's Roost was right here. This is Mulberry Street right here. That, these buildings are still there. And he gets the city to tear it down. Now, does that solve the problem? It doesn't exactly solve the problem because, of course, poor immigrants will just move elsewhere. Alcoholics and homeless will move elsewhere. But this is kind of the end of five points. Because now with, it, with the Five Points intersection torn down, Mulberry Bend torn down, Bandit's Roost torn down, other places in the city become the most infamous immigrant neighborhoods. But that doesn't mean immigrants stop living there. It becomes Chinatown eventually. This is an image taken in the late 1990s of an immigrant bunk room. This is one of those same 12 by 12 foot rooms somewhere in Chinatown. The photographer wouldn't tell me exactly where all he would say was somewhere in Chinatown. And now they've built triple, the, the immigrants have built triple level bunk beds in the 12 by 12 foot room. So there's beds along one wall, beds along the other wall, a little passageway in the middle. These are Chinese immigrants who are typically paying their way, paying smugglers to smuggle them into the country. And then they have such huge debts in the tens of thousands of dollars that they are trying to scrimp every way they can. So they live in these tiny rooms sharing all this space. And then what they do to save even more money is they may rent this bed, but then they sublet the bed out to another immigrant for half the day. So some other immigrant gets to sleep in the bed from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., and then the other immigrants that sleep in it from 9 p.m. to 9 a.m. So if one person works a day job, they sleep in it at night. The other immigrant works a night job, sleeps in it in the day. So you can ask how much has really changed. Here's another Jacob Reese image of a Lower East Side garment shop in a tenement in 1890. Here's a Chinatown garment factory in a tenement in the 1990s. You tell me how much has changed. So that is the short version of the history of five points. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. And now I'll take some questions. The question was, was the, was the origin of gang activity in five points between Irish and Italian immigrants? No, it goes back further than that. So it's going to start with, with kind of fighting between native-born gangs and Irish gangs. And then by the time you get to the potato famine, the natives have pretty much moved out, and it's Irish gangs versus Irish gangs. And then later, Irish versus Italian. And then after that, Italian versus Jewish. The big fight for control of the Chinatown nightclub scene between the Italian mafia and the Jewish mobsters from the Lower East Side. And they eventually have a truce, and they kind of agree this street the Jews get to extort money from the nightclub owners in this street. The Italians get to extort money from the night, nightclub owners. Um, and then it's eventually Chinese gang. The question is, why is Uptown the place where elite New Yorkers want to live? So it starts because, you know, what you see here in Five Points is buildings get built. Oh, here's our food. Buildings get built. And then they don't get torn down. So if you want the nicest house to live in, it's going to be a newer house. And the newer stuff is constantly being built further uptown where the land isn't occupied yet. So for a long time, the nice housing is always a little further uptown. And that's especially the case once Central Park is built, and then that's the place people want to live near. Um, and then eventually, you know, eventually, of course, there's a limit to how far up people are willing to go because the business, you know, Wall Street is still downtown. It's, 
So, so eventually that stops, but that's the reason. Let's answer. So the mortality rate. So in your typical, on your typical um, voyage, you would have, say, 500 immigrants on one of these ships. And your typical mortality rate um, throughout the period, say, from 1840 to 1860, would be one out of every 100 immigrants would die on the ship. And then probably another two or three would die soon after arriving, but we don't know. But that was what the Irish would talk about. Um, and that's typically because the, so the disease you most often got on one of these ships was typhus. Not to be confused with typhoid, but typhus is a bacterial infection that you got from body lice. So if you're all crammed in the steerage quarters there, three in a bed, right? Body, it's perfect condition for body lice. The lice poop on your skin. Then when you itch because of the lice, you make little tiny microscopic holes in your skin and you scratch the lice poop under your skin. The bacteria from that gets under your skin, infects you, and you get typhus. The main symptom of typhus was a diarrhea that looked like rice. And you thought, hmm, I didn't have rice. And the reason that the diarrhea looked like rice was because the walls of your intestines were flaking away in what looked like rice. So amazingly, amazingly, most people didn't die from typhus, right? Probably about a third of the people who got typhus would die. Today, you get typhus, you get an antibiotic, it's solved. And plus, it's not such a big thing anymore. But back in those days, um, and so that was the main way you would die. So if you, you could get typhus the last week on the ship, but it would take you a week to get sick, so you might get off it. So a lot of people died of typhus after they got off the ship. Now, in the worst years of the famine immigration, when, when so many poor and diseased people are packing onto the ships, then sometimes it was two or three per hundred. And then on the worst ships, like some individual ships would be particularly hard hit. And on some ships, you might have 10 or even 20% of the immigrants die. But overall, 1% in the worst years, 2%. And then how are the tenements financed was the other question. Um, typically by banks. So like the Emigrant Savings Bank, if you were an immigrant, they would lend you money to build a tenement. And that was the way that, that, because it was a great investment for banks because Manhattan real estate was so secure, right? It was never going to really go down that much in value. So banks were eager to lend to people who wanted to build tenements. It was very dark. Now, the thing you should know if you go to the Tenement Museum, which I highly recommend, so that's built in on the Lower East Side. And immigrants on the Lower East Side tended to have more money in the, in the Civil War period. They were more likely to be German immigrants who had more money. So the Tenement Museum is a three, each apartment in the Tenement Museum tenement is three rooms. So it'd be the same 12 by 12 front room, but then two bedrooms, one behind the other. Um, still very dark, but you do have more room than you had in the Irish and Italian neighborhoods. So that's a great question about the food, and I talk about that a little in, in the Five Points book. Um, so the first thing the Irish, when the Irish write letters back home from Five Points, they always talk about food. And the first thing they always say is, so back, when I mentioned that they ate potatoes in Ireland for every day, there were two days that were an exception for your average poor Irishman. Easter and Christmas. So those were the two days you would have scrounged up money for meat. It would be terrible meat, but it would be meat. In five points, they write back, not only do we eat meat every day, we eat meat for every meal every day. Right? So just like now, bacon was really popular. So they ate meat for breakfast. The most favorite meat for the Irish immigrants was lamb. So you can go, they've done archaeological digs in five points. And they look and see what the five pointers were throwing away. And lamb bones are the number one thing you find in the backyard. Uh, in the backyard garbage pits of Five Points. So mutton, this would, this would not have been lamb, it would have been mutton, so let, you know, sheep they're allowed to grow to adult size. So mutton was the number one popular meat dish. Bacon, number two. Um, but then, the, you know, t the interesting thing is that other than the meat, the Irish don't talk much else about what they eat in America. They talk about the meat and not much else. So in terms of vegetables, we know like 
uh, cabbage was popular, potatoes were popular, but now as a, an accompaniment rather than the main focus of the meal. Um, but you don't have, say, the variety of vegetables that the Italians will have. So that's not, you know, that kind of scene I showed you, the photograph of uh, Five Points when it becomes Italian. You don't have scenes like that of vegetable stands in, in the Irish day of Five Points. Yes, so the main way that illegal subdivisions get caught is by neighbors squealing on people. And short of that, you rarely throughout the city's history have people, uh, have people, uh, you know, investigating, going into people's houses without, you know, without the complaint of a neighbor. So the first question was, um, how do I know, how do we know about five points from the view of its inhabitants if they were illiterate? And so, well, there's a couple of things. First, so the bank, the immigrant bank recorded, you had to sign your name if you opened your account, and if you couldn't sign your name, they would record that. So we know that about three quarters of the male Irish immigrants were literate. At least they could write their names. And, but only about a third of the women could write their names. So that tells you something about schooling in Ireland. Um, but so the thing, and so when I started on the project, people said, you're never going to be able to do this. You're only going to be able to get the biased views of outsiders because these people were illiterate. But so first I found that a good portion could write. And there were some records. But then the, one of the great things I found was the police and court records. So even if you couldn't read or write, you could give testimony. And the police would record this in affidavits. And the DA would record this in affidavits and in court testimony. So I found lots of descriptions of Five Points by the residents. And I was able to use that to, to recreate what Five Pointers thought of the neighborhood. And then your other question was about the Scorsese movie, Gangs of New York, and is it accurate? I, I've, I have given an entire lecture on that subject, so, but let me give the brief answer. So I, if, you, if you stick around in that movie to the very end, and then you go through all 15 minutes of the credits, the very last thing before filmed in Panavision is thanks to Tyler Anbinder. So um, among other people. <laughs> So, so I, I had sit in that theater a long time. They're sweeping up the popcorn, but there it finally appeared. And so I read the, he, Scorsese asked me to read the screenplay and point out the errors. And so I went through the screenplay, and I would say, and basically each minute of the movie is a page of screenplay, and the movie was, what, two and a half hours, so that's 150 pages. And I would say there is an error on every page of those 150 pages. And I pointed them all out, and I would go to the first one, and I'd say, all right, this, this isn't accurate. And he'd say, yes, I know that's not accurate, but that scene occurred to me in a dream, and <laughs> I, really believe, I really believe that my dreams are, are a very important part of my artistic motivation, so I, that scene has to be that way. So I'd say, fine, I turn the page. i say, all right, on this page, here's, you know, this isn't accurate. This would have happened 30 years later. And he'd say, yes, I know that. But that scene is an homage to a scene in the 1926 film Battleship Potemkin. And that's why that scene has to be that way. I say, OK. And I turn the page. And I would say, all right, this scene, there's a, there's a scene in which the immigrants are getting off the boat. And how many of you have seen this movie, Gangs of New York? That's a decent number of you. There's one scene where. Immigrants are getting off the boat, and the, the camera pans, and the immigrants are getting off the boat, and then they're here on the dock um, being made citizens, and then you pan over here, and they've come to the next table where they're enlisting into the Union Army, and then you pan over here, and they're getting on another ship to go off to fight in the war, and then the camera gets back to where it started, and there's a different ship there, and coffins are being taken off the ship of dead Civil War soldiers. And I said, oh my gosh, everything is wrong about that. And he says, yes, I know that, but this, keep in mind, this is the late 1990s. He said, every director's jaw will drop when they see that scene because they'll say, how can he go around like this? And when he gets back to here, there's a whole different ship than that was there 15 seconds ago. They'll all, wonder, they'll all say, that can't be done, and I'll be considered a, a genius. Now, now those, that's done with computer graphics, right? Everybody can do that. Probably my 12-year-old can do that on her, on her Mac. But, so that's, he says, why that has to be that way. So of all the things, I get to one page. 
where I say there's a scene where Leonardo DiCaprio is leading the Irish immigrants up to vote for an Irish candidate for sheriff to try to defeat the anti-immigrant candidate for sheriff. And the immigrants, uh, he's leading them up, and the immigrants, they all go into a little booth with a curtain, and they take a piece of, uh, take a pencil, and they tick off a box next to the name of the Irish candidate. I say, well, that's not right. You didn't vote in a booth with a pencil. I said, because most of the immigrants, many, so many were illiterate, you got your ballot outside of the polling place. It was pre-printed. You went to a glass bowl. You put your pre-printed piece of paper in the glass bowl, and that was how you voted. And Scorsese said, aha, I can fix that. And he called, turns to all his, his entourage, and he says, fix that scene. And they're all like, oh, yes, we'll fix that scene. And so the movie comes out. We get to that scene. They're in booths with pencils, just like before. So I can say, I think I literally changed nothing about that movie. But, but what I learned is, he knew all the mistakes. He knew everyone. He knew as much New York history as I did. Um, but it didn't matter to him. You know, what he said was, he said, making a movie is like making an opera. You, you don't expect historical accuracy in an opera. You should not expect it in a film. So the, the burial ground that you're talking about, if we go all the way back up here, right. And so they're not like right next to each other, but undoubtedly there. So the, here's five points, and the burial ground is kind of down here. And so it was, you know, the African American neighborhood was once here, and then as more well-to-do people moved uptown, African Americans move further up to another then undesirable place. And so it's connected in that African Americans were constantly being forced, like other poor New Yorkers, to move out of neighborhoods when more well-to-do people wanted to move into them. Right, so for a long time, African Americans stayed in the neighborhood and shared it with the Irish. Like this block here, this side of the street was black, this side of the street was Irish. And you had a couple of other blocks like that. Once you had the New York City draft riots, where the Irish had this outpouring of rage against black New Yorkers, the Irish move out of, I the African Americans move out of Irish neighborhoods. And move, a lot move to Brooklyn, a lot leave the city as a result. Uh, yes, that's correct. What was the fire situation? Well, so the interesting thing, so obviously in those days, without fire hydrants, without water pumped throughout the city, People were very, very careful about fire because a fire could start and it, would, it could burn down half the city. And you had several examples of that where huge swaths of the city were destroyed by fire. So amazingly, you, had ne you never had a huge fire in Five Points in the whole period that I wrote about. Other parts of the city, yes. And so it's not clear whether it's because the Irish, being so poor, having so little money for fuel, weren't burning very much, or if they did, they were very careful about it. Not clear. But for some reason, this was not a fire-ridden neighborhood. So the question is, why did William Poole, who was a kind of infamous New York, you wouldn't call him a gang leader. Um, you would call him kind of a neighborhood political leader, maybe like a ward healer. So he's, so, in that period, the, the most powerful people in politics in, in kind of the, the more working class neighborhoods would be often people who had been, who were famous as fighters. Sometimes as prize fighters, sometimes kind of as the leader of, and these would be political gangs. So, so we think of gang, we think of crime. But in five points in the Irish period, the term gang did not connote crime. It more denoted a group that would turn out on election day to defend your turf against another group who might come and try to intimidate the voters in your neighborhood. So, so Poole is one of these people who's, who's known as a tough, uh, and he's known as being anti-immigrant. And so, there, you know, as in any period in American history, when there are a lot of immigrants, there's often a lot of anti-immigrant sentiment. And, so, you know, just like today, where aspiring politicos find that they can get a lot of support by bashing immigrants, Poole is one of the people who did that. Great question. Why were the Irish attracted to the Democratic Party? So, often in politics, people are attracted to a group, sometimes less for what the group stands for and more what their opponents stand for. And so, in this case, 
the Democrats' opponents, starting out with the Federalists and then the Whigs, were known as being first um, anti-Irish and second um, anti-Catholic. So the Whigs in particular in the 1830s and 40s wanted to kind of make Protestant, evangelical Protestant in particular, uh, views into law, so like mandating that no liquor could be sold on Sundays, that businesses couldn't be open on Sundays. Um, and so Irish Catholics, not wanting to be forced to follow Protestant rules, gravitated to the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party, in return, rewarded Irish immigrants with patronage jobs and so forth and political appointments sometimes. And so that's the short answer. And then the long answer is like chapter, I think, 10 of the five points. But whatever the, there's that chapter called politics, and that's a longer answer to your question. So the, the first thing is he has the people coming off the boat and immediately becoming made citizens. And so that wasn't the case. Like today, you had to wait five years to become a citizen. Now, if you signed up for the army and you served for an entire year, then they would let you become a, a citizen after one year. But there was no way that you could become a citizen on the dock as soon as you got off the ship. So the question is, well, what was the influence of the Catholic Church? What did they do to help the immigrants? I'll kind of sum it up. Um, so it, the answer varies over time. So are there churches? So the Catholic Church in New York is relatively poor in the 1840s and 50s. So rather than build churches, they mostly, what would have, so in Five Points, there was a Lutheran church. There were hardly any Lutherans left in Five Points. So the Catholic church bought the Lutheran church and turned it into a Catholic church. That church is still there on Mott Street. I don't know if you've ever seen that. Mott Street, uh, kind of just below, below Canal. No, that's further up. That's north of Canal. We're talking further down. Um, and so they would do that. They would buy up underused Protestant churches, and that would be the cheapest way to establish new parishes in New York. Um, it takes money to start schools, and these Irish Catholic immigrants don't have much money. And so at first, they don't do much starting of schools. Um, but eventually, they start to start. So this is, this is one of the reasons Boss Tweed becomes so infamous in New York was, this is by the late 1860s, New York Irish Catholics want to start parochial schools. They don't have the money to do it. So they go to Boss Tweed, head of the Democratic Party. They say, look, we've been voting for you guys for years, helping you win office. You have to do something for us. We want money for our school. And so Tweed sneaks into the year's uh, state legislature appropriation bill, money for parochial schools for various New York Catholic parishes. And it passes. Nobody even knows it's there besides Tweed. And then once it's found out, it causes a great controversy and a kind of an anti-Catholic backlash. But so, so the answer is initially the Catholic Church is overwhelmed and can't do very much. The first thing they do when they have a little money is charitable work, trying to help people who are hungry or who don't have clothing or don't have fuel. And then by the late 1860s, they're moving into things like education. The extent the Irish, that the Catholic Church in Ireland becomes weak, it's weak for the same reasons it's weak in New York, is that the people who go to it don't have much money to support it. Whereas the English pour a lot of money into their Church of England churches in Ireland. Um, so I think it's weak in that sense rather than a lack of, of faith. I think it's more a lack of, of money. And so the church, Catholic churches are very few and, far between, you know, few and far between in Ireland where it's very hard to get around. Um, but then you have within, as you have within any immigrant community, you have kind of divisions in the Irish community. There's the part that's very deva devout. And then there's the part that says the Catholic Church is what's keeping us down. And we, you know, if we keep following what our priests say, we're never going to get ahead. And, and they're making us unpopular by demanding all these things. Why don't we just go to the public schools and become Americans? So you have divisions within the Irish immigrant community on that. Sure, just like today, immigrants back then found occupational niches, right? Something that this one group would specialize in. And so in Five Points, the, a disproportionate number of kind of the skilled craftsmen, the cabinet makers, the carriage makers would be German. 
the Irish would be disproportionately in jobs like day labor and household work. But you even find these niches within the Irish. So I found, and this isn't in the Five Points book, but it's in the research I'm doing now. So there are people from this one little town in County Kerry, and they dominate the workforce at the New York City gas works. From this one town, Castle Gregory, in County Kerry of Southwest Ireland. And then the charcoal business in New York was dominated by people from County Tyrone in Northern Ireland. And then peddlers. You would think, well, anybody can become a peddler. But a hugely disproportionate number of Irish peddlers were from one place, County Donegal, in Northwest Ireland. And so even within the communities, you have these niches. And in part, it, you know, it can be as simple as one person starts out as a peddler and is successful, and then when the next person from his town comes and says, and goes and moves in with that person while they look for a place, and says, what should I do? Oh, be a peddler. I can't cover all the territory I, I need to, you take part, I'll take part. Then the next immigrant comes through chain migration, which has become a, a kind of a term of opprobrium today, but, but wasn't back then. And then that next person takes another territory and, and, and so forth. And so the Irish divided up, not only did they specialize in certain things, but even certain Irish immigrants specialized in certain things. So the question was, were there utilities in yes, the- Yes, what's available. Right, so most, in the, in the period we talked about today, most of these tenements did not have gas, and the reason was the landlords were afraid that the gas would start a fire. So they preferred that the buildings be dark, so the, the hallways are completely dark. You literally have to feel your way up the stairs. Um, so they, they keep them dark for that way. Water also, in the period we're talking about, no water inside at all. All the water is in the yard. You fill up a bucket, you carry it up the stairs, and that was how you got water. What's that? Right, indoor plumbing comes in the end of the 19th century. Thank you.